on the new health insurance scheme. Let's see what you're saying at Trevor Mbija at Citizen TV Kenya. Use the hashtag Monday report. We'll pick them one at a time and Dr. will write down the questions and address them. Then we take the second round of questions from the practitioners here who have their own concerns. So let's pick out about three of them. Ondeng Moses says, what is the difference between NHIF and SHIF? Was it necessary to transition from NHIF to SHIF? I think that is the first question that Dr. Ari answered. So that is already answered when he came in. Okelo James says, MOH is on record revealing that NHIF is losing billions through doctored claims and fake surgeries and no constructive legal action is taken against the perpetrators. What guarantee does SHIF have for Kenyans that it won't follow suit? That's one doctor, so write that down. What guarantees does SHIF have that it won't follow suit? Kazimali says, NHIF is confusing with super cover. Is there something similar with SHIF and what is it? Explain in detail. I'll repeat that again. Kazimali says NHIF is confusing with the super cover. Is there something similar with the SHIF? And what is it? Explain this in detail. Okay? Let's get the third one and then we pause there for a bit as Dr. Ari answers, then we get the next. When is this fund going to start working? Because now we have active NHIF, but after visiting some hospitals, the card is not working. So let's answer those three questions first. When will this start working? Because now after visiting some hospitals, the card is not working. Okay. Yes, Dr. Ari. Thank you. Um, starting with the, with the issue of a start date, yeah. which is what they said, the projected start date is supposed to be beginning of March. That is what we had anticipated. However, that is subject to us having all our ducks in a row and making sure that the system works properly. I want to so emphasize. That might be extended. Yeah, it might be extended. I want to emphasize that the objective here is to make sure that we don't disrupt service. Okay. So there's no need to get locked into a date and start causing disruptions in the system. So at the end of the day, we will make sure that the transition is seamless, that all preparations are in place. We have registered people, and that is when we're going to start. So technically, until the regulations are gazetted, we can't start registering members. Okay. And we'll start registering members, and once we register members, we start onboarding them to the new system, but the NHIF infrastructure is what we're still using. Mm. So service will be continuous, but the projected date was supposed to be beginning of March. Okay. Correct. There's the next question. There's the aspect of fraud. Fraud has been a thorny issue, all right? And it's a very painful issue because fraud denies a lot of Kenyans the resources that they could be able to benefit from, and we've got a lot of unscrupulous people who are making benefit where they should not. Yeah. So what are the guarantees that the guarantees that the guarantees that we have is places one, we have carefully studied the the perpetration of the fraud. The only way we can be able to stop fraud is by putting in safeguards to ensure we don't even get to the point where people are able to to go through the fraud and be able to, to get benefit where they don't. So it is going to be a combination of having a very robust HMS or IT system that is going to make, become paperless so that you've got a lot of dashboards that are able to flag any unusual activity. That is number one. But more importantly, we have got to onboard at the Social Health Authority now, we are going to be onboarding only staff. We're starting afresh. It's a new body. So even the staff within NHIF are going to have to apply to get the positions first. They must be fit for purpose. But secondly, we want people who have got integrity who don't have any of those issues that are coming from NHIF. Yeah. Thirdly, there has got to be consequences to fraud. And this is one of the biggest problems I think we've not had in the past because people have gotten away with it and there's been no serious con consequence. In terms of the legislation, the legislation is actually very clear. The penalties are clearly defined. The issue has got to become enforcement. But part of the thing is, especially within the audit department, within the authority, we have got to have people who are going to have, be able to investigate things, first of all, to prevent fraud. But secondly, the threshold of investigation must reach that threshold where prosecution, where necessary, can be done. And thirdly, the act also specifies that any funds that are irregularly acquired will have to be returned, okay. recovered. Okay. So those are the things that I can say at the moment. So we have, in essence, we are saying our fraud detection systems have got to be top notch and we are learning from past experience, hopefully, so that we don't go into that same mess again. Okay. There was another concern about the NHIF cards not working and what is the difference with the super cover? Okay. Yes. Um, NHIF cards not working. I don't know what not working means in this particular case. I don't know whether it's that they are, the facilities they have gone to do not accept the service they have. They, they, are, they were getting, but I, I want to also clarify, this is one of the reasons why even a lot of the schemes that are being run, you might find, for example, according to the current uh, act, 
we are not supposed to manage enhanced schemes. So the act, the moment the, the act was signed into law, any schemes that have lapsed are not going to be renewed. So it is very possible that you could find somebody with an enhanced scheme who goes to hospital and wants to access that service, and that has already been been done away with. So it is possible. At the moment, I cannot say SHA is the one that is running the system. So the reasons why a card would not be working were for various reasons. Sometimes, again, cards might not be working because payment has not been made. To, uh, subscription has not been made. So I don't know what the specific reason in this case, yeah. but in general, that's what but, I can say. But as it about. stands, can you guarantee Kenyans that their NHIF card should work as usual? Yes, it will work as usual. And when there's a time when we have moved on to the new cards for the Social Health Insurance Fund, yeah. they will be notified because they will get new, re registered and get new cards. Okay, let's finish up the questions and bring them up again. I believe there's still a few more. And then we'll check the next round of questions from the practitioners who are here with us. And Rowan says, I am Patrick from Kericho. My question tonight is, what percentage of my medical bill is Social Health Insurance Fund going to pay for a patient? And are there exemptions in terms of coverage? Let's answer this one now directly. Patrick says from Garijo, my question tonight is, what percentage of my medical bill is Social Health Insurance Fund going to pay for a patient? And are there exemptions in terms of coverage? Generally speaking, the Social Health Insurance Fund is going to pay a certain flat tariff for the entire country for every single procedure. Now We don't have that figure yet. Yes, but if you say in terms of percentage, yeah. I can give a general guideline. Okay. In terms of percentage, it is going to be a proportion that should be able to cover bills in full in public facilities. Private facilities are a very diverse group of people. Yeah. So at the end of the day, if somebody goes to a private facility where their, their charges are going to be higher than what SHIF is paying, then they'll have to top up. And that we have given freedom. Everybody will get the standard package and you choose where to go based on your ability, based on your preference. So if somebody decides to go to a high-end medical facility, they go there under the knowledge that they're going to top up. So the percentage depends on which kind of facility you go to. Okay. But in general, we're trying to cover most of the procedures, especially for public hospitals, should be covered in full. But again, that tariff will be determined based on once we're through with the regulation, we know what uh, financial projections we have, then we can be able to see what level that tariff is set at. Okay. So there, there was a question about exemptions. Are there any exemptions? Exemptions in general are going to be, if you ask me, procedures that are not necessary, mm. that are not deemed medically necessary. So, for example, cosmetic type procedures and so on. Those, are, those in general for most types of insurance are not going to be things that you can fund from public sources. Okay. But in all medical conditions, medical conditions that require treatment will be covered. Josiah, That's the beauty of social health insurance. Josiah Diema Diema says, students had a medical cover in the UK's regime. Can this government succinctly address themselves, the students, insurance cover do parents or school heads are they supposed to dig deep into their pockets for the students or what is the policy on this I think I already alluded to that earlier and I said students come from households and the objective is to cover all households so students will be covered as part of the households from which they come okay let's take the next round of questions yes, uh, two questions you know uh, I'm a bit perturbed uh, by what my brother is saying regarding this thing of uh, the, the level of coverage that will be given. And if you look at NHIF, the way it was yeah. in 1966, it was only for civil servants. In 1998, when it was repealed, it has been covering almost every Kenyan, particularly in the public sector. If you go to a public hospital today, you'll be covered. Uh, unlimited coverage in actual public sector. So what then is difference with the shift that it can only cover you in the public sector? That's number one. Number two, if we look at this aspect of the special coverages that were there in NHIF, that is the uh, uh, EduAfia, which was covering every, every, every uh, school going child, uh, ch uh, child in uh, probably high school, what it meant is that regardless of the socioeconomic status of your parents, if you are sick in a facility and you go to a public facilities, which we know, and he knows very well, that they're totally dysfunctional in the country. There are no drugs in those facilities. There are no doctors. There are no re reagents. So they are almost sending you to death in those facilities. So as, as, as much as we know that, when you go to those facilities and you don't get the care you need, you will go to any other facility and your parents will not be burdened by funds. But now if it's removed, it means that you, your parents must have money to pay. That's one. Linda Bama, this is my brother, asked about it here. It has been just, as long as we register in the MAMA, it does, you don't have to pay anything. You don't have to be in any contributory scheme. You will go to facilities and get care. How, how many mothers now who otherwise will not be able to pay to contribute or to get any funds and will not be able to access care? That's another thing that is very, very critical. On the main testing, we know that most Kenyans are living in a poverty line. That's the reality. Why would we spend $3 billion to do mean testing to check how, to what extent people, people who are poor are poor? 
Because that's what is being done here with this mean testing instrument. Yet we know, even if you look at the NHIF, the expense for last year, there was a balance of 11 billion. So what, what, is this, what is this issue? What is the, the sanitization or the angel shift going to do that they could not sort out with NHIF? The other thing that is very critical, which he has not talked about, is the claim management of social health insurance fund is actually privatized. We are going to have private insurance companies now going out to actually manage the public fund. What is it that we, we it is very clear from that that SHIF is just out to give business to private insurance companies. In fact, the other thing is that SHIF was stopping these comprehensive covers so that private insurance companies should not be a competitor with them. And that's why government is going to stop it, and government will again buy private insurance for the civil servant and other workers from a private insurance company. Okay. Why not all that money being invested there? Okay, Dr. Starting with the question, I think the issue of the enhanced schemes, I mean the, the schemes, the Linda Mama and so on, I think I already covered, but I'll re-emphasize again. They come from households, they'll be covered through those households, there'll be no duplication. The concern here, Olwen, is that they come from household, they have to pay for contributory aspect for them to access this care. But now we know Linda Mama, which I think from last year, February, the government holds almost uh, 15, uh, like different facilities across the country, almost 15 billion, yeah. because they were trying to support this NHIF. Yeah. Now this Linda Mama, if it is stopped, yeah. are you unable to pay? How will that household? But is the doctor is saying that if a household is unable to pay, then the government pays? Yes. Unless no. indigent. Yeah, they yeah. talk about loan. They said loan. They don't no. say that you will pay. Okay. Indigents. Yeah. Indigents. Mm -hmm. The people who get loans are those people who have been assessed, and this is the amount they should pay. They sort out themselves, get a, a loan to be able to finance their premium. Those who are not able to pay will be paid for, including those, in, for the first time, even including those who are in custody, right? Even those who are in the prison. So everybody in the entire population will be have, Ministry of Correctional Services will pay for them. Those who are indigents are going to be paid for by government. So the aim is to get coverage of everybody. And that is why the additional schemes are not necessary. So we don't need to worry about a student who can't be able to pay because but they come from- But you've said- Let him yeah, finish, let him uh, It's finishing, let but let me, you just said here yeah. that for these, have the, to be fair to the, me, the different thing about the school <laughs> going children yeah. was the Edu Afia, whereby it, it, you can access care in any facility. But now, from the shift which has put, has put up clearly, why we actually fighting it also as civil servants yeah. is that now you have a limited. Is the is the NHIF that you are going to have before the school is per cover? Yeah. You can only go to the public facility, yeah. which in this case is not functional. That was part of the questions he was about to answer. Now the other thing, I I am actually a bit surprised that Dr. Davji, who represents a union of people who work primarily in public facilities, can sit here and tell us that they are not functional. But it's reality. Delivering no service. It's reality, and that's why they chose somebody from private sector. Let, no, let us let us be <laughs> fair. Let us no even me. I've, I yeah. I do I have I got a background in the private sector. Yes. But you cannot disparage our public facilities and say that they are not. No, that is not correct. Okay. Let's not embroider the truth beyond recognition. Okay. Otherwise, then why why don't you just shut down the hospitals? You are saying they're not brother. Working. Brother, if you know right now that, uh, like in counties, yeah. uh, 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 over only forty-seven counties, whole oh, comes about seven billion. All these counties across the country, they have not employed health workers for the last seven years. Okay. You get me. The national government has not released funds to counties okay. for the last three months. But so they are dysfunctional. Let him answer. That's the reality. Yes. They <laughs> may our, not be our healthcare perfect. system is not perfect, but I want us to yeah. let, let's put things in perspective. Okay. People are walking into public hospitals even today. They are getting treatment and they're getting well and they're going home. So let us put it in perspective. But, but yeah. right? No, no, no. Let, let, that let, us, let us put it in perspective. Questions, let I do agree they have got some shortcomings. And those are the things that I'm saying we're trying to address through injecting additional funding. One of the things I talked about is in terms of once additional funds are injected into the sector, hopefully the knock-on effect is that, first of all, they'll be able to increase their capacity. First of all, the supplies, because of the ring fencing, they'll be able to get better supplies. They'll have more funds to be able to employ additional health workers. So we want these facilities to work, and that's the objective of this together with the FIF bill. So let us be optimistic in terms of we cannot give up and say our hospitals are not working, because if our public hospitals are not working, then now it means even as a social health authority, then it means we have got no mandate because there's no health care to pay for. So what I'm saying is there are challenges, yes. They are functioning to a certain extent, and we are hoping that will be augmented. That's why we want to get to universal health coverage. And one of the principles is to be able to provide health care of sufficient quality for it to be effective. So 
That is, that is on the issue of the public hospitals and the indigents. Then the enhanced schemes I think I already addressed and I said principle of social health insurance. We don't want to create a lot of disparity because one of the things we're trying to do is equalize this. What is happening is at the moment those people who are more well to do are the ones who are benefiting from a healthcare system and are getting a good deal from the healthcare system and we've left everybody else behind. So at the moment what we're saying is let us try and equalize things so that those who, are, who have got more ability to pay, let them be able to get augmented care if they want. But even in the case of the enhanced schemes, why don't we see what this so-called basic package, which has been improved, is, yeah. and then even see whether we need to augment it. Just to might very well be. Uh, just let to finish let one thing. Let me finish, WG. Yes, we're not finished answering your question. You know, what is important here, if you are augmenting care for people, you don't need to take somebody from a cover and downwards. You need to bring everybody to have a comprehensive package. Okay. Dr. Ari, finish answering the questions. Huh? Okay. So in terms of the enhanced schemes, yeah. that discussion is going to be based on the person who wants to enhance. And this discussion, I've mentioned this, Dr. Davji, before, is a discussion between the employer and the employee, all right? Uh. If, for example, the, we, we have got this basic care, which is being provided, and I'll call it basic, but as far as I'm concerned, it should be comprehensive. Mm -hmm. If somebody feels they still need additional benefits, you have a discussion with the employer and say, you know what, there's my medical allowance which you had taken away. Yeah. I had got this cover which you're paying for through NHIF before, can we get an alternative? But the approach which they're adopting is insisting that the social health authority must be the ones to take that mandate, where there's other providers. Mm -hmm. And But the good thing is, this is a vindication of NHIF because the way they're aggressively insisting that NHIF or SHA should cover this, I actually, um, I think we needed to give NHIF a pat on the back because they must have done a very good job on this scheme, all right? Yeah. Now, he talked about the means testing instrument and the practicality. I talked about earlier and I said, we have got 85%, 80 to 85% of our population who are in the self-employed segment. A lot of them are not carrying their weight. So you might say that, oh, why do you want to do a means test to confirm people are, the poor are poor? We also want to confirm those people who are rich and are paying 500 bob are rich enough to give us more contribution. So that is what is going to bolster that kitty. So it is something that is going to be done once. And that is not to say that if somebody is, is indigent at this point, they will stay indigent permanently. You can get a job, isn't it? And therefore, your status changes. Or if somebody who is more well-to-do can also lose a job, and their status changes. So there is going to be periodic testing. But as a baseline, at the beginning, we need to have everybody tested so that we know what level of contribution is equitable, so that it will be fair to everybody. Otherwise, you will have those people in salary and employment being the guys who are carrying the weight of this scheme, and everybody else is getting a, a free ride in a fancy car. Okay. All right? There's another question on whether this is for the private sector, that you're going to look for another insurance. Claims management. Yes. Claims management has also been a testy issue, right? The act, in fact, the original draft when it was a bill, said that the claims management, certain functions there, shall be outsourced. After the public participation that was done at that time, it was changed to May. May meaning it's we've got discretion as a social health authority to decide whether we can efficiently carry out this function or be able to outsource it to a third party. And those third parties were clearly defined. They said it's a medical insurance provider or claim settling agent that is registered by the I Insurance Regulatory Authority. So it was qualified. It's not that it's something that can be outsourced to any Tom, Dick, and Harry outside there. It is somebody who's been vetted by the Insurance Regulatory Authority. The reason why we have also done this, the act is also very cl clear. We have got a 5% cap on our administrative fees as social health authority. The objective being the majority or the bulk of the funds must go to paying for health care as opposed to administrative costs. But you realize that 5% is a very tight thing. So efficiency is extremely important. Mm. So if we find, for example, is a private provider who can be able to carry out this function efficiently, all right, and help us save money and still deliver on what we were supposed to do, yeah. then that option exists. Okay. At the moment, no decision has been made on that. Okay. And has been made on whether we are going to outsource that function or, or not. not. All right? But the option is there. Yeah. Davji, what would you suggest as a healthcare practitioner yourself on the issues you've raised? Because even if it's NHIF, if you go to public health, sometimes if you decide to go to a private health, you still have to top up. This is not anything new. Uh, so that's, that's, that's what I was bringing up, that ideally, if the government's intention is to bring universal healthcare access to the Kenyans, then it should be such that when you have that card, you go to any hospital that is offering the services, you should be able to access that care. And that's what was in NHIF Amendment uh, Act of 
2022, whereby there was a costing of services that was being done between NHIF and providers, so that if you have the card and you go to a facility, as long as they've been accredited to offer that services, you don't need to say it's baseline, you have to top up the money. And on the flip side, we have the civil servants, who here is saying that there's a leeway from this act, you need to talk to your employer. The employer of the civil servants, who are about, with the, the families about six million, is actually the government. So how will government bring an act and tell you, no, we took your a medical allowance, we are going to increase your contribution 17 times or 10 times, but now you go talk to your employer again to get the cover, to, to give you the private cover. So ideally, the cover should be such that whatever the, 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 the civil servant have been having, which you go to any facility, you access the care. That's what should have been escalated to all the Kenyans. Not that we just say that's just a baseline. The other thing that I must say here is that... But we don't, do we have the cappings yet of what the base let is? Me, let, me, let me clarify this, if you'll allow me. I want, I want to clarify this. I said that it is going to definitely cover all public institutions. Private institutions are not a, are not a homogeneous mix of hospitals. Private hospitals, you've got what you can call five-star hospitals, and even at the moment we have got rural hospitals, for example, in this country, that were providing that same comprehensive cover where people were going to the, the same way that they went to public facilities and they were not topping up, isn't it? So that option still exists, and if you ask me from the business perspective, it's going to be a decision for those individual hospitals. If you ask people to top up, what happens? Chances are people are going to walk away, isn't it? So you, it might very well be that they are going to change their business model and say, you know what, let us take this rate, and increase our volumes, and that's how we're going to be, make our businesses sustainable, isn't it? Okay. So that is not to say, that is going to be at the discretion of the private institutions, and faith-based institutions in general have already been very moderate in terms of their fee structure. So chances are, again, faith-based institutions will be in that net. Okay. So I have not said that there's any issue of people having to top up, but for a fact, there are certain facilities that if you walk into, SHA is not going to be able to pay Nairobi hospital fees. That is clear, all right? It would not be possible because we're not getting value for our money in terms of our principle that we want to take care of the largest number of people and get the brain, get okay. its benefit. Mary, I promised Mary and Martin a chance to ask questions, and then I'll give you a chance for closing remarks because we really run out of time. But, uh, yeah, Mary, yeah. My, my question was about uh, costing of house services, and especially in private, and I'll start from where it just stopped. Yeah. Most likely in our situation, no one is going to walk away from that facility because while Chief is going to pay for the services in public hospitals. Remember, we work, we're talking about public hospitals that are very insufficient in terms of staffing, in terms of, in terms of equipment, in terms of everything. And um, this is a patient who knows the cover is going to pay. But they're in a theater list that is a month date from today, and you expect them to wait. They'll not wait. They'll go back to that private facility and try to top up. They sell whatever they can sell from the household to top up so that it can uh, happen faster. And this takes us back to the issues of access and again back to the issues of out-of-pocket expenditure. So we we'll still have not solved the issue. And then my second question is um, um, on, on public awareness on, on what uh, the authority is planning to do because the same questions of transitioning, why are we not using the old data? Why are we transitioning from, they, they keep coming. And those are some of the questions I'm getting from relatives, colleagues, friends. So what are they planning to do in matters um, making the public aware on what exactly SHIF is coming with. Okay, yeah. Dr. Ari. Just to top up, no, no, no. build up on that. <laughs> no, no, uh, you, just can't, you, can't take, you can't take various time. <laughs> just one minute, I will, I will have finished. Let's have, let's I will have, have just finished. Let's, let's, let's <laughs> answer, Mary. Let me add it. No, no, let that answer, Mary. <laughs> So on the issue, on the issue of, of topping up, I think, I think uh, once the tariffs are out, then we, I think we can have that discussion. You know, because right now we, have, we, don't know we, are, we are speculating, yes. But then what are we discussing so, regulations now? What is the public participation we're going through? Because, I mean, you've already told us we have 2.75% we need to get from our monies. We what, is going, what is it going to cover? Based on the public I think let's not confuse the, regulations and tariffs. Yeah. Regulations, it's part of tariff. we have got the act. Yeah. Regulations are cover. supposed to operationalize the act. Yeah. The tariffs come at the tail end. And I've explained earlier, the tariffs can only be determined, the specific tariffs can only be determined when we know how much money we anticipate to have. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we'll be making a promise on tariffs at this stage and then having to modify them either upwards or downwards after 
we are through with the regulations and the and the So to make it and yeah, this point, we still don't, don't have. The so you don't have the targets, yes, but, but you know the money that you need to be collected. Two point seven five. Based on the services that we want to provide, that is how the two point seven five was. But you should have people those 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 services we want to offer. Otherwise, no, no, no. no. Love <laughs> I want you also to be fair to me. Yes. I was not involved in the process of determining those things. I was appointed chairman on twenty second of November. Yes. So mine is to make this thing work. Yes. All right. Yes. And I want people to trust that we are going to act in the best interest of Kenyans. I've told you the logic that led to this point. Yes. I don't know why Dr. Davji uh, no, no. Dr. Davji is so... No, this was Mary's turn. <laughs> yes, I'm just adding yes. something which is, yes. which is on efficiency. We mm. said that the privatization aspect is to bring uh, the claim is to bring efficiency. We have a, a particular administrator here in the country called a Medic, Me Medicine, uh, Me uh, a Medical Administrators Kenya Limited, MKL, which took over management of funds for the police and for the teachers. Mm -hmm. To date, it has not paid a plethora of hospitals in the country to the point that those who go to the hospitals have to be directed where they're going to go. Okay. So what efficiency then yeah. are we hoping to get in this uh, shift? The, 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 the answer Mary first. Yes, go ahead. No, let me answer this one on the tail end because it's yes. simpler. Yes. <laughs> he, has, he has mentioned a specific uh, administrator. administrator. Which probably the role here is going to be very different. Yeah. The administrator he's referring to was being given the funds to manage. At the Social Health Authority, the funds are within the Social Health Authority. The only function we want for them is to verify those claims, right? And send it back to us and say this is payable. They don't handle funds. So there should be no concern, first of all, that the, a third party is going to be holding funds that are meant to be used for pay. If anything, they'll have an incentive to be more efficient because, if anything, they are going to be paid based on how efficiently they, they manage those claims. Okay. The faster they do it, the better. Secondly, in terms of this issue about claims management, it is a decision, like I said, that has not been made. The option is there. But in addition to that, in anticipation of that because of the given the volumes that are there. And I'll give an example. Yes. NHIF at the, at the moment pre-authorizes sometimes up to 5,000 claims in a day. It's a massive volume countrywide. So what was said is we're going to divide the country into zones based on geographic region, on patient load and so on, and divide into eight zones so there's no single med MIP or claim settling agent that will be given more than one zone to manage. So we have spread that risk that way. So even if there was any inefficiency coming from one person and so on, yes. we have mitigated that risk. Okay. Make one no, WG, <laughs> let, let him answer Mary's <laughs> questions. Yes. He's even Mary, uh, was, one was the what public... What make one don't divide itself <laughs> yes. be this yes. clear management? The act, the act was very clear in terms of it said that we are going to have to register members. Reasons being, firstly, I think the model in which we are registering members, this was household based as opposed to the previous one. That, however, does not stop us from using the same database that we have within NHIF to be able to hasten that process. But however, the Act specifically says that you have to come and register because it is a new fund. Mm. And especially because we're having two additional funds here which did not exist, it is important that we get this data and that will help us in terms of managing, okay. managing the fund. Okay. And I think you still raise questions in terms of the out-of-pocket expenditure. Exactly. And yes. Yeah, but the out-of-pocket, I said, we, we can only determine that out-of-pocket once we see what the tariffs are. But you see, the, no, no, no. the issue no, Martin, of... Martin, Martin, no, no, just before Martin, yes. out-of-pocket, no, 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 just the part of out-of-pocket. Let's have some order. Let's have Thanks, Martin ask his questions, I, then we close. I think tied to that is the question on the quality of care. Yeah. What assurance does the authority give uh, Kenyans uh, that they are going to address the issue of quality of care that bedeviled the old system, where you go to facilities, either you don't get the service you require or you do not get the medication. And again, then we end up uh, in the question of out of pocket because you're told, go buy it in the next shop. Tied to that is the issue of uh, registration. I go back to registration because this is the point of access. If you're not registered, you cannot access. How? or what steps is the authority putting in place to ensure that nobody is excluded from accessing healthcare courtesy of a process called registration uh, so that you do not uh, exclude people uh, from the system just because they have not been registered or they are unable to register. You will realize, for example, if the history of Linda Mama, there was a lot of problem on, with people accessing uh, the service. Why? Teen mothers, they could not be registered, and it was a big process to get them registered. How do we ensure that nobody is excluded from care because of the question of registration? Last but not least is uh, the payment from uh, NHIF. Most of the payment went to the private sector, meaning that uh, this is public money. 
collected and then it largely builds private business. And then we get back to a vicious cycle of public hospitals are unable to provide the basic care that the population needs. How are we addressing that so that we are at the same time improving uh, the standards of the public health facilities uh, as we collect money from the public to finance health care. Okay. That will be the last set of questions. Then I'll give you all a chance for closing remarks one minute each. Good. Yes. First, I'd like to address the issue of quality of care. That's a very good question. You know, one of the intrinsic, uh, one, of the, one of the core principles of universal health coverage, like I said earlier, is the quality have to, has to be over, sufficient quality to be effective. And that is important. As a social health authority, we are a bit disadvantaged because we pay for care, but that quality, we are relying on the other institutions. Whether it's a private hospital, public or faith-based, we are relying on them to provide that care first. So you're talking about the issue of the facilities and the supplies and so on. So that we are relying on them. And that's what we are hoping. And that's why, for example, on our board, you'll realize, I said we have incorporated health being a devolved function. We have got somebody from the COG and we've got somebody from from the CEC Health Caucus. But other than that, we've got the PS Ministry of Health also sitting on our board, isn't it? Other than having somebody from the faith-based sector and from the private sector as well. So we've covered everybody in terms of interest. And our emphasis is, please step up your capacity in preparation for this so that we've got health care that we can pay for and of sufficient quality. Down the road, there's also plans for a quality authority and that will address now all those issues to do with quality within health, within health institutions. On the aspect of registration as a prerequisite, Registration, we are proposing and we are recommending to people, please register in advance, not at the point when you need care, because there'll be some le level of inconvenience. Also, it is not going to be possible for us to pay for somebody whom we don't know whether they're a member. If you have not registered, chances are it means you might be able to access the service in the primary health care, but you know social health authority at the social health insurance fund is going to be very difficult for you to come and pay at that time and access service at that time. So we are proposing as much as possible. Let this be done in advance. That's why there's a 90-day window that we say people should try and get this registration done. So Will you it could also be because we know can it is no, no it, we are recommending within 90 days it it is also said in the act that after that registration will be continuous okay. so nobody is being locked out okay. but we are preferring that you do it in advance of you needing care mm -hmm. then the aspect of funding going to the private sector one of the biggest problems that we have is the agility with which the public health care system versus the private health care system. So in, whenever changes come through, the private health care system might adjust very fast. For example, those supplies you're talking about and so on, if you have somebody going to a public facility and there are no supplies and so on, the t tendency is they'll run to the private sector. And it'll be very unfortunate for us to get public funds and pay them predominantly to the private sector. That's why I'm appealing, especially those who are managing public facilities, including my, those who are working there, like my brother, Dr. Davji Atela, to make sure that the public facilities, to make sure that, wait a minute, wait a minute, to make sure that the public facilities also work, so that we have got a significant portion of the funds going to public facilities as well. Okay, Martin, you start with the closing remarks, one minute. Thanks, Trevor. I think uh, with the coming in of the new authority, uh, Article 43.1, uh, of our, a of our constitution and two should be made a reality. The authority must not adopt the cherry picking of healthcare services. Okay. Uh, there need to be focus on all healthcare services, including reproductive healthcare services, because that is at the basic of care for a large population. And it should really not only to be adults. Healthcare is for everyone. Let us remember that uh, children, adolescents, adults equally need care. And if you don't take care of young people as they grow up, they will need uh, more advanced care uh, in the later stages. So right. we look forward to a situation where the constitution, the right to health, right. including reproductive health care, is a reality to okay. all Kenyans. Dr. Just write it down because I'll give you the final say on this. So you might have to answer some of the questions they'll still raise in their closing remarks. Mary, <laughs> closing remarks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Trevor. And uh, I would say that uh, pulling of funds to create um, healthcare, or rather to make Kenya access healthcare is a good thing. But again, um, we see very glaring gaps in the current uh, proposals. And I believe it's not late um, for calling stakeholders to try and rectify this before it is uh, fully implemented so that um, it benefits us as the healthcare providers, the facilities, and Kenyans in general. And, um, so that to ensure uh, we achieve the UHC that we have so much longed for in the long run, uh, while ensuring we are carrying all the pillars of health systems with us so that nothing is left behind. Thank you. Okay. Davji? 
Uh, ideally, uh, Trevor, Chief is uh, returning us back to 1998 when NHF was actually repealed. Because ideally, as much as Brother Luen is trying to really advocate for it in all this uh, manner, and not because he has a job, but in reality, uh, the, 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 the covers that it's going to give will actually increase out-of-pocket expenditure. And I see that, and he, rebu uh, he tried to rebut it, because most of the out-of-pocket expenditure is actually going to the private facilities to seek care when you're not covered by an insurance. But he has said here that this particular insurance will only cover you fully in the public facilities, the same way NHF was doing. So majority of the people who will be getting these cares in the, in the private facilities, because we know unless things change in the public sector, which we're demanding to change, most people will have to uh, uh, use funds to access the care. The other issue is the issue of private uh, of getting care abroad. For this shift now, for you to get care abroad, they say that that service must not be available in the country. It can be available in Nairobi Hospital or in Agakan, but it's very expensive. That's why families uh, go to India and all that uh, and all the other places. So ideally, it should be that whenever wherever you want to get the care and you know it is certified for you to get the care, you should be allowed to go get that care. The other important component that I must also say about shift is that it's it's or rather a way to privatize healthcare. Okay. Why are we saying this? Because it is putting uh, all the level one, two, three to compete with the private facilities. And yeah. that's why even the composition of this board, the, 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 it's very explicit. There's nobody who work in the public sector who is allowed to be in this particular board. It's majority of the members of these boards are only pr all pr from private sector. Okay. Even Kenya Medical Association or even uh, uh, trade unions. So as long as you're from public sector, you can't be there. Okay. So there's more pro propagation to pay for funds, to, to actually make funds go to the private sector. The other thing that is also very critical here is that we have medical allowance that uh, uh, I see the same sound we're, get, we're, 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 getting, we're, mm. we're getting, which they relinquished. Yeah. We have, um, the contribution has been the, uh, increased seven, 10 times. Yeah. So you realize that, for example, a doctor will be paying 200,000 a year, and then the chief and the government say, like, you go talk to your employer yeah. to get you under private insurance because they know it won't cover. Okay. Yeah. All right. So why so would you why would you be in a situation by, whereby you pay and also in terms of household? Yeah. They'll put it such that if, for example, you are you are two of you in a household, yeah. it has to be two point seven five percent. Even if there's a third person who is twenty five years old, that is considered a different household. Okay. So there's a, a bit of. Uh, of, of issues in this in this act that are not clear. The other right. thing, which is also which, which I had said differently, is that you can access primary health care fund and you access, uh, can access chronic uh, um, uh, critical and emergency care fund without being paid up. But that's why we're in court, okay. and that's one of the sections that was stopped in the court, okay. that which was actually saying that you must. Uh, for you to even access public services, both in the county and national government, you must have been paid up. All right. Dr. you are going to answer very many questions as you close in your remarks. Alphonse Were here also says, majority of employed Kenyans are not in trade unions. How is their interest going to be taken care of in SHIF, decision-making organ? How are they going to be represented and their voice heard, given that they are majority contributions of the 2.75%? And there's also Dr. Kigondu, who says, excellent discussion. Congratulate the discussants. The positive side of SHIF is a dispute resolution mechanism. That's Dr. Kigondu, KMA president. There, Bob Dolo says, uh, can this new cover replace the billions various government bodies spend on private insurance covers yeah. while the same public officers still contribute under the new scheme? Is that a double cover? Now you're closing the box. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to first of all address uh, uh, what Dr. Tari, uh, my colleague, has said about that the, it seems to be a privatization of the board. And I want to demystify that. Our board has got 11 members. As the chair, I'm a presidential appointee. Then we have got five people who are public servants. The PS Health. Presidential appointee and chair. It's his closing remarks now. The PS Health, the PS Treasury, the Director General of Health, CEC Health Caucus and COG nominee. Those are five. That is the reason why we had to balance it with another five who are not public servants. And those five were, after that, were four stakeholder nominees as Kenya Medical Association, informal sector, consortium of healthcare providers, COTU. All right? So, and then there was one CS appointee who was also not supposed to be a public servant. So the reason I think that was designed that way, I'm not the one who designed it, but I think it was to create the balance between the private and public sector. Otherwise, you have a board which is so heavily public sector that again the decisions will be swayed by the government and you must remember again people like the ps health is actually the boss in our line ministry so he, those are very influential people so it has to be balanced with people who are not in the public sector and that's the reason why i think the law was designed that way now the robust conversation that we have here tells me 
One thing I'm happy about is that this is important. It's extremely important. And that is why we want to move on to public participation. This, everything is not cast in stone as we speak. We have got two weeks of public participation. We have got room to be able to get memoranda and opinions and, and views from the general public, from organized, uh, organized groups and so on. And that information is what is going to be crystallized when we're finalizing the regulations, the comments, and anything, any, people must always remember, you know, we have got a way of being able to look at our own interests and think they must supersede everybody else's. There's always a contrary opinion <laughs> that somebody else is sharing. So the balance has to be found. No, no, you know, we're doing public participation on things that, that have been decided. No, I'm, really, I'm really interrupting you. I know you're I'm just saying, no, no, the no, public no, no, no. participation we are doing, finish. things have already been decided. Let Dr. Terry finish his okay. closing remarks, yes. Dr. Terry, when you say things have already been decided. And, and it is more of a public manipulation. But there's two weeks of public participation now. Yes, go ahead, Dr. Terry. So, after that public participation, yeah. people will go sit down and look at, collate the views. And after that, we're even going back to the National Assembly and the Senate to be able to vet these things before those regulations are gazetted. Let's be honest, it is not going to be that everybody's view has been taken into account. There has to be a balance which has to be found. So, but the good thing is this robust conversation needs to continue aggressively and actively for the next two weeks for us to be able to come up with a document that is more acceptable to everyone. All right. Then you talked about people who are not employed, who are some people are employed and not in unions. I would want to say that if they are employed and not in unions, it becomes even more important if they feel that their their views have not been represented sufficiently or they're not sufficiently represented on the board. We need those views because there's nothing stops that stops even an individual Kenyan from sending an email with particular views and uh, and we take them into consideration. Okay. Thank you so much, gentlemen and lady, Dr. Timothy Oluen, Chairperson, Social Health Authority, Dr. Davjia Tella, Secretary General, KMPDU, Mary Christine, National Treasurer, Kenya Union of Clinical Officers, and Martin Onyango, Center for Reproductive Rights. And thank you all for the views that you've sent through. There's still public participation. You said two more weeks, and this is a conversation that can still be had. As soon as anything comes up, we'll definitely bring it up here for more discussion, because at the end of the day, it's all about you. On behalf of everybody else who made this possible, the entire team, my name is Trevor Mbija. Say goodnight and God bless.